with the addition of multi-band pass narrowband filters. People who use a color camera, such as a DSLR, mirrorless camera, or a one-shot color astrophotography camera can also do narrowband imaging, just like their monochrome counterparts. However, processing that data can be a little bit tricky. So let's hop on to the computer for another astrophotography tutorial session. As I demonstrate how I create a HOO bicolor narrowband image using data that was generated from a one-shot color astrophotography camera and the multi-band pass narrowband filter. My name is Kwesi Akwa and welcome to the Astro Park. In this tutorial, I'll be using these following programs. Okay, everybody, so first we're going to start an Astro Pixel Processor, or APP for short. So this is the program that I use to stack the data that I collected from a color camera and a multi-band pass filter to create the narrowband image. And this program uses a pretty elaborate algorithm to actually split the wavelengths from the narrowband filter to create the narrowband image, which I think is pretty neat. So what we're going to do is an APP. We're going to split the HA and O3 data into two separate images. Then we're going to take those images and bring them into PixInsight to use pixel math to combine the images together. Then we'll use that combined image to do further editing to create the overall final result. So first in APP, you want to select your working directory, which is this gray box where my cursor is right here. So I've already selected it initially. And one thing you want to remember that I discovered recently, you want to make sure that your working directory is within the hard drive that's internal to your computer. You don't want to use an external source such as a external flash drive or external USB hard drive. Because I notice when I use those devices, when I do the integration for the stacking, it produced some unwanted artifacts in the form of horizontal streaking through the image. So when I transferred my files to the drive that's inside of my computer, I didn't have that problem. So just want to keep in mind that you want to make sure that your working directory is within the hard drive that's inside of your computer. So I've selected my pathway, so I'm going to click open. And now we'll begin by loading all of the files. So first I'm going to deselect the multi-channel filtering because I'm not using that for this session. So for this tutorial, we're going to be working with the files that I shot with my imaging session that I did for the dumbbell nebula that I did in my most recent video. And for multi-session processing, I'm going to leave that checked since I shot this over two nights. But if you just did a single night's worth of work, you can uncheck this. But for my um, scenario, I'm going to leave this checked. So for my deep sky object name, we're going to work with extracting the hydrogen alpha data first. So I'm going to call this M27HA for hydrogen alpha. Okay, so let's go ahead and load the files. So I'll start with the light frames. So I need to go back, files. So I'll load N1, which is night one. 
So everything that had an L is my light frame. Open that up. So this is for session one. Click OK. And do that again for session two. And two. So all the light frames there. And this is for session two. And you just want to do this for all of your calibration frames as well. So I had a separate channel for flats as well. So let me go back to night one, flats. Session one. And then session two, flats. Night two. Session two. And then my darks and biases are basically universal. So dark frames. So I want to click all sessions for this one. And then bias was my last one. And all sessions. Cool. So after this portion, you want to go back a step to click on this tab here, raw fits. So for your pattern, since I'm using a color camera, you want to select a Bayer matrix, so mine's is RGGB. And you want to force the color array, so keep that checked. And then for the algorithm, so this is the important step here. So you want to scroll down and choose HA03 extract HA. So we got that there. So now at this point, you want to basically look at your individual light frames and check to see which ones you want to be stacked. So you want to um, basically inspect each light frame just to make sure that everything looks good. So I'm going to uh, take a quick look at these. So here, for example, this is a single three minute exposure for the Dumbbell Nebula. So you can see there's some really good detail there. Uh, there's a little bit of some amp glow in this corner here, but that's fine because the dark frames will take care of that. So you wanna take your time to inspect your light frames, make sure that everything looks good. So I'm just gonna go through each individual light frame, pause the video here for just a moment, and I'll be right back. Okay, everyone, so I completed inspecting all of my frames. So I dropped the frames that were of low quality. So I'll be stacking 100 of my three minute exposures. So that gives me a total of five hours of integration time, which is really good. So once you've selected all of your frames, you can then click the calibrate tab. And basically I leave everything on its default setting of automatic. So I just want to scroll through. You can play around with the options if you want, but I've noticed that automatic does give me some really good results, so I don't mess around with it too much. And then everything that's checked by default, I just leave there. And you can go to analyze stars. So automatic stars detect, so it'll detect 500 stars in the photo. And then you want to click on registration. So everything here is default, so I don't really change anything here. So that's fine too. Then you want to click on normalize. Everything should be default here as well. 
And then on the integrate tab, this is where we're getting ready to integrate all the frames that we've taken. So I'll be stacking the 100% since I've already combed through all of the bad frames. So I'll be stacking 100 of those exposures. Integration should be automatic as well. Everything else looks fine here. So everything else looks good. So I'm just going to click on integrate and it'll register, analyze the stars, and then integrate all of the images. And then we'll have the hydrogen alpha extraction. So let's go ahead and do that. H alpha, that's correct. So I'm gonna click OK. Yep, so now it's gonna go through the calibration, analyze the stars, register all the frames, and then integrate the final image. Now this process can take several minutes depending on the speed of your computer. So I'm just gonna go ahead and let this work in the background and through the magic of video editing, I'll show you the final result. So stay tuned. Cool, so looks like the integration is completed now. So this is the extraction of the hydrogen alpha from M27. So you can see there's some stacking artifacts because I had to reposition the camera after every um, adjustment that I made. But it did its best and the core is a little bit overexposed, but that's something that we can clean up when we get into pics in sight. So compared to a mono cam, you know, mono camera would be better because it would have higher resolution, but a color camera definitely is no slouch either. And I pulled out some of that wing structure too from M27, which is pretty neat. Now usually hydrogen alpha is usually the stronger signal when it comes to emission nebulae, but since M27 is a planetary nebulae, the H alpha isn't as prominent. It's more prominent in the O3, which we'll pull out in just a moment. And O3 is stronger in also a supernova remnants as well. But this actually looks pretty good. So I'm go, gonna go ahead and save this. So I want to unclick the stretch check mark because I'm going to do the stretching inside of PixInsight because there's still some things I want to do to the image while it's still in the linear state. So I'll click Save. So yeah, so no stretch, okay. So I still want it to be a fits file. And there we go. So the next thing we're going to do is extract the O3 data. So you go back to the raw fits tab. So the only thing we, we need to change is the algorithm. So now we'll be doing HA03 extract O3. So click on that. Do you want to renormalize the data? Yes. So Basically, the only thing we're changing is the O3, so everything has been registered, integrated, and all the stars have been analyzed. So the only thing we need to go back to is the Integrate tab and reintegrate this. So click Integrate. The only thing we need to change here is change HA to O3. And click OK. And it'll go through the same process again that we did for DHA. So I'll be back in just a moment for the final result for the O3 data. Okay, so now this is the processed image for the Oxygen 3. And as you can see here, the wing structure is much more pronounced here, which is really neat. And I got some additional details on the outside as well. Again, the core is a bit overexposed, but it's something we'll clean up once we get into um, PixInsight. 
So you can, see, you can see the O3 signal is much stronger in a planetary nebula. So once again, I'm going to leave the stretch box unmarked. I'm just going to go ahead and save this. So O3, no stretch, OK. And I still want this as a FITS file, so I'm going to give that an OK as well. And that's pretty much it for everything that we need to do in APP. So we have our separate H alpha image and we have our separate O3 image. So now we can go into PixInsight to combine both of these images. Okay, so now we're inside of PixInsight, which is a program that needs no introduction as it's one of the popular go-to programs for astrophotography editing. So in PixInsight, we're going to take the individual HA and O3 images that we created in APP, and then we're going to combine those images together to create our bicolor narrowband image. Then I'll walk through all the individual steps that I took to edit the combined image. So first let's begin by bringing our images into PixInsight. So I'm going to open this up and I want to select the ones that are not stretched. HA03, so I can open that up. All right. And we could do a auto stretch with the screen transfer function. So that's this button right here. So that's for 03 and this one is H alpha. Okay, so H alpha on the left, O3 on the right. So we're going to combine both of these images together to create our bicolor narrowband image. And we do that by using what's known as pixel math. So to find that, we go to processes, click on all processes, and find pixel math right here. So in pixel math, you want to make sure that this box is unchecked because we're not going to use a single RGB expression. So we'll go to the expression editor. So up top, you have these three squares, so the red channel, green channel, and blue channel. So red channel is assigned HA, green channel O3, and blue channel O3. So H O. Oh. So as I mentioned in my video that I did with the Dumbbell Nebula imaging session, this is the part where you can bring in a little bit of creativity. So instead of just HOO, you could do OHO or OOH, or maybe H alpha in the red, O3 in the blue, and maybe a mixture of both of them in the green channel. So the possibilities are practically endless, so you can experiment with different color combinations. But for this tutorial, I'm going to focus on the HOO. So I click OK. And go down to Destination. So we're going to create a new image in RGB color for color space. And then you click the square to apply. And here's our processed image. So we can close out pixel math. So this is the image that we're going to do the editing on. So let me minimize these, put these in the background for now. So let's do an auto stretch on this. All right, so the first step I usually like to do is if I have any stacking artifacts, like you can see here, I have the stacks are in different 
alignments because every hour I did a focusing routine and that changed the orientation of my camera a little bit. So we're going to kind of like cut out these stacks here on the edges. So you do that by doing a dynamic crop. So I have a pre-made tab here, but if you don't have a tab, you can go to processes, go to geometry and click on dynamic crop. So basically what I want to do here is find where all the stacks basically intersect. And I'm just gonna make a square cut out of that. So I think I might start here. And it looks like maybe about there. So you might have to play around with this just a little bit just to figure out where everything lines up neatly. So I believe maybe something like this. So we can go with that for now. So once we select our region, you can then click the green check mark and everything else on the outside should be cropped out. So let's go. And there you go. So there's the image that we're going to work with. So next on the list, I'm going to do a DBE, which is a dynamic background extraction. So I'm going to pull up my pre-made tab here. So this technique I learned was from a gentleman named uh, Sean Nielsen, and he has a astrophotography channel called Visible Dark. And Mr. Nielsen is basically a Pixinsight guru. So this DBE technique, I actually learned from him. So Sean, if you're watching this, thank you for your assistance on this. And if you all are looking for some excellent Pixinsight tutorials, definitely check out Visible Dark as he has a vast library of videos that talk about different topics on Pixinsight. So for this DBE, these are the parameters that Mr. Nielsen recommends. So I'm going to use a tolerance of two, shadow relaxation of six, and a smoothing factor of 0.25. And when you're selecting your sample points, you don't want to have any sample points on your subject, so this nebula in the middle. But from my personal experience, the DBE tends to work when I just put the sample points on the edge or the perimeter of the image. So I'm gonna go ahead and remove these ones because these are preset from a previous image that I was working on. And using the set points on the edge also works with galaxy subjects as well. Move this one right about there. Remove that. So just want to leave the ones on the perimeter. There we go. So first we're going to click on target image correction. So I'm going to do a division first. So the DBE basically removes any excess light pollution gradients that your light pollution filter may have missed. So I'm going to do a division first and then I'll do a subtraction afterwards. So I'll be doing the division and check discard background model and replace target image. But before I click the green check mark, I'm gonna make a quick duplicate. So I'm gonna click this triangle. So I have my duplicate process because I'm going to do the subtraction on this. So let's hit the green check mark for division. And you get this, but that's perfectly normal. So I'm going to go ahead and close this and reset the screen transfer function. Okay. So we have our process saved. So I'm going to double click on this again. So it has all of the parameters that we did for the division already preset. So I can just change the division 
to a subtraction and then hit the check mark again. And there we go. So that's the DBE process. So, you can close this. so the next thing I do is a uh, color balance. So there's various ways to do color balancing, but I was able to find a auto color script that I've been using that works pretty well. So I'm gonna go ahead and load up that script. So if I go to utilities and the script is called auto color. So I just click on that and it will do the auto color balance for me. Now, depending on the speed of your computer, this might take a few minutes, but I think I noticed for me, it takes probably roughly about a minute to a minute and a half. So, shouldn't take too long. So yeah, I just finished the red channel. It's working on the green channel. And the blue channel should be coming up momentarily. There it goes. Cool. And there we go. So we have our image now color balanced. Let's move that out of the way. So next step I want to do is uh, linear noise reduction. So the ASI 294 did a pretty good job, but you can see there's still some noise once I zoom in a little bit. So we could do some noise reduction on this image. So there was some techniques that I learned for noise reduction, but I recently discovered something called the Easy Processing Suite, and it has a noise reduction algorithm in there. So if I go to, let me see, should be in the script, yep. So we go to Easy Processing Suite, and click on Easy Denoise. Yep, so this is the image I want to do the noise reduction on. And I leave everything on its default settings, but feel free to mess around with these values to your liking if you'd like. But I've noticed personally that the default settings work pretty well. So once you do that, we can just run easy denoise. And it goes through a very extensive you know, process to do the denoise procedure. So for my system, this actually takes several minutes. So I'm going to uh, pause the video here. And once the denoise de process is finished, I'll come back in just a moment. OK, so the easy denoise process is now completed. So if we zoom in a little bit, you can see how the background is much smoother. So it took out a lot of that excess noise, which is really nice. So we have now completed the noise reduction procedure. So the next thing we're going to do is actually stretch the image. So, so far I've been using the auto stretch function to give you a preview of what the nebula would look like. However, it's still in the linear state. We haven't applied the stretch algorithm to it just yet. And that's what we're going to do in the next step. So we apply the stretch by doing what's known as the histogram transformation. So I created a tab here, but you can also go to process, all processes, and then find histogram transformation. So first, let me turn off the auto stretch and I'll bring up my tab here move this to the side a bit so first I'm going to reset and then click this check mark to track and then click the circle to bring up the preview now there's several stretching techniques that I've used in the past but one of them that I found to be the easiest is that you can actually apply the auto stretch to the official stretch. And I'll show you how to do that here. So you go to process, all processes, 
find your screen transfer function. So this box right here. So we're going to take the triangle, the instance, and then on the histogram transformation, place it on the bar right here. So you'll see there's an hourglass next to my cursor. So you just drop it on there and there's the stretch. And then all you gotta do is click apply a square. And close this. And now we have the stretch. So it's really simple. So we can close this out. And you can see how the red, green, and blue channels all line up as neatly as possible, which is what we want. So that's really good too. So we can close the Instagram transformation. And now we have our stretched image. So next with like a color camera, I would sometimes apply the SCNR. So this is the selective color noise reduction. So you can pull out any of the colors, usually green, because with a color camera, you usually tend to have a green overcast because it collects twice as much green data as opposed to red and blue data. But at first glance, I don't really see a green overcast, so to speak, so I'm not going to need to do the SCNR for this image. I tend to do it for my broadband images, but for narrowband images, it's, it's fine. So probably the next thing you'll notice here is the core is white and washed out. So I basically most likely have probably overexposed it just a little bit. So for a future improvement for this photo, I'm going to plan to take shorter exposures to stack along with my long exposures to preserve that core detail, to create like an HDR image like you would with the Andromeda Galaxy or the Orion Nebula. But there is a way that we can actually bring out those details. And we do that by doing the multi-scale linear transform. So I have a tab right here, but if you need to find it, again, it's in process, all processes, and then you want to find the HDR multi-scale transform. So I'm going to go ahead and bring up my tab. So the default number of layers is six. So the lower this number is, the more aggressive the function will be, and the higher the number, the less aggressive it will be. And by default, you want to use the B3 spline 5 scaling function. And we're going to apply this to the lightness mask, as well as preserve the hue to try and maintain those natural colors within the nebula. So before I even apply this function, we need to actually create a mask to do the work on the core of the nebula. So to create the mask, go to process, mask generation, and we're going to do a range selection. So I'm going to bring up my preview here, and I'm going to increase the lower limit a little bit. And you can just kind of like play around with the slider to your liking. So I want to try and get some of the, the wing structure here as well. So I want to protect that too. So I think maybe like that. Then also you want to also apply a little bit of, not too much fuzziness. I think the fuzziness is fine. But the smoothness factor, because you want to smooth it out just a little bit so you don't make it too harsh. So I think, yeah, that might be uh, too much. I think it may be 24. Yeah, 24 should be okay. So I'm going to go ahead and click Apply. And there's the mask that I generated. Close this guy up. So to basically apply the mask to our image, we just 
select the range mask tab and just drag it over and it'll apply it. So basically everything inside of here is what's going to be affected by the transform. So everything in the red is not going to be affected. So we can actually close this preview here by clicking this here. So the show hide mask button. So right now we're showing the mask, but we don't really need to see it. So we're going to hide it. But the mask is still active because the tab is this orange brown color. So let me tuck my mask away momentarily. All right, so we've, we've applied the mask. Now we can do our HDR multi-scale transform. So I'm going to go ahead and click apply just to see what the result will be. Usually the default is a nice go-to. But you can mess around with it to your liking because it's just up to the artist at this point. So this will probably take just a few moments here. And there you go. So now you can see that when we apply the linear transform, we can see the inner details of the nebula. So if you zoom in a little bit, you can start to see that X structure, as well as some of the supernova remnant, which I think is pretty neat. So when I processed this earlier, I used the default of six. So I think maybe a five or higher might be a little bit too aggressive for my taste. But as I mentioned before, it's all artist prerogative. So I think I'm going to go ahead and stick with the default settings for this one. So I did a really great job. All right, so I'm going to close this out. So usually next here, I would maybe do a little bit of sharpening. But from my point of view, these details stick out really nicely. So. I think maybe adding some additional sharpness might make the image look maybe a little too unnatural. So I think I'm going to, for this tutorial, skip the sharpening details for now. So yeah, it looks pretty good in my opinion. So I'm just gonna leave it like that. So next I would do a curves transformation to apply some contrast. So like the histogram transformation, we're going to do a reset, track, and then set up our preview. So for my personal taste, when I do a contrast transformation, I don't like to make the background too black because in space it's not pure black. There's actually some cosmic dust that if you apply too high of a contrast, you'll lose some of that finer detail. So I just like to apply a gentle S-curve. So I'm going to bring this down a little bit. And I'm going to bring this up a little bit. And you can play with that in the preview just to see what it looks like. So it looks like I'm applying some contrast to the Core. So let me turn off the mask because I also want to get some of that wing structure as well. Yeah, so I think that, yep, so I've turned off the mask. Yeah, so I think that might be a little too contrasty. So let me reset this and try again. So I'm going to bring this down a little bit. Bring this up a little bit. I think that looks pretty good. So I'm going to take this triangle, drag it onto my image, and apply. And there we go. So now we have some good contrast there. So I'm going to close up the curves. Then the final step I do is to apply some color saturation. So I'm going to bring that tab here. So the first 
color boost that I do is both to the nebula as well as the background. So I take the slider in the middle. So before I do that, let me reset and do a preview. So I take the slider to the middle and just start dragging that. And then as you can see, when you apply the saturation, the preview starts to change a little bit. So right now I'm changing both the color of the nebula as well as the background because I don't want to make it too intense because you can see there's that structure there. So just want to make it nice and natural. I think maybe for this first boost, I don't want to oversaturate the background too much. So I think maybe this might be appropriate. So that'll be my first boost. So I drag and drop. So now I want to do maybe just a little bit of saturation to the nebula. So I'm going to go ahead and reapply the mask. So click enable in the mask here. So once I do that, I'm only affecting the nebula by itself. So you'll see the color for the nebula change a little bit. So if I drag that up, so you can see how the nebula is changing colors a little bit. So that's what I'm focusing on there. So I think that might be a little too much saturation. So I'm gonna maybe just take it down just a smidge. I think maybe right there should be good. And I just drag and drop again. Cool. So I can close that up. And now we have our completed image of M27, the Dumbbell Nebula. So at this point of the processing, I would save the image as a TIFF, T-I-F-F -F file, and then bring that into Photoshop to do some additional touch-ups. But for this instance right here, I believe we have our final processed image. So that's how I create a HOO bicolor narrowband image using data from a one-shot color camera and a multi-bandpass narrowband filter. If you have any additional questions or comments on the process, feel free to sound off in the comment section down below and I'll do my best to try and help you out. Thank you for watching AstroPark. And until next time, take care, and I wish you all clear skies.